Now let's talk about a really important object in physics, the Dirac delta function. And so the Dirac delta function, or function in quotation marks, uh, because it's not really a function, it's a distribution, is defined to be zero when x is not equal to zero, and infinity when x is equal to zero. So if you were to draw it, you'd have an infinite spike at x equal to zero and zero everywhere else. Very funny function. Um, despite this singular nature of it, um, nonetheless, the integral of the delta function, the area underneath the delta function, is equal to 1. So the delta function has unit area, despite it being an infinite spike. One way to think of this is that uh, the delta function is really the limit of some sequence of functions. So imagine you consider a sequence of functions that are, look like boxes. So a box, which is fairly wide, not very tall, and has area 1. And now imagine shrinking the box and making the box higher and higher to keep the area equal to 1. So as you shrink it, you have to make it higher and higher and taller and taller. And so complete this process until you have a spike at only x equal to 0. And that's what we mean by the delta function. Some other properties of the delta function are that whenever you multiply a function times the delta function, that's equal to the function at the point where the delta function spikes, so f at 0 times delta of x. Uh, this is used in an integral if you integrate f times the delta function. Well, that's just the function at 0, so the delta function really just picks out a number, and that number is just a constant. You can pull it out of the integral, and now you have the integral over the delta function, which is just 1, so this is really just the value of the function at 0. So a delta function is really useful because it can pick out the value of a function uh, at a particular point, here at x equal to 0. You can shift the delta function over in order to pick out values at other points. So if you can shift the spike, delta of x minus a has a spike at x equal to a. So whenever the thing inside the delta function is equal to 0, that's where your spike is. So again, for delta of x minus a, you'd have something that is 0 everywhere except at x equal to a. And that's where you'd have an infinite spike. OK, so again, if you multiply a function times delta of x minus a, this picks out the value of the function at x equal to a. Again, the delta function is kind of picking out values at particular um, points, wherever the delta function spikes. We can consider a three-dimensional delta function. Uh, and so for a 3D delta function, we're going to define this in a general way as delta 3 of x is delta of x, delta of y, delta of z. And what we mean by that is that this is 0 whenever any of the coordinates is not equal to 0, and it's equal to infinity when each one of the coordinates is identically equal to 0. Again, a delta function really only makes sense when you think about it under an integral, namely thinking about its area. And so the area, or the integral, of the three-dimensional delta function, if you integrate it over all space, that's what we mean by R3 here, well, this is really a triple integral over the x, y, and z directions from negative infinity to infinity, delta of x prime, delta of y prime, delta z prime, dx prime, dy prime, dz prime. So let's just write this out. This is three separate integrals, delta of x prime, dx prime, delta of y prime, dy prime, and delta of z prime, dz prime. Each of these integrals is equal to 1. You can do each of these just like a normal delta function. So you have 1 times 1 times 1, which is just 1. So under an integral, a three-dimensional delta function behaves very similarly. Um, you can also use this to pick out values of functions. So if you have a delta function r prime minus r, where r, big R vector is some constant vector, this is going to pick out a value at r prime is equal to big R. And so this integral gives you the function evaluated at big R vector. So let's use this in some physics. So what's the interpretation of a charge distribution? Rho is equal to sigma delta of s minus r. Well, this is 0, except where this uh, cylindrical coordinate s is equal to r. So if we were to draw a picture, when you have a cylindrical coordinate equal to r, you're going to have something there. That's what we mean by uh, 0 accepted s equal to r. And so we get a picture that looks like this. Well, this looks like an infinite cylindrical surface. And so this charge distribution, sigma delta of s minus r, represents a cylindrical shell of charge that has some surface charge density. 
and that surface charge density is sigma. Okay, so now what's the electric field everywhere? Well, let's use Gauss's law to find the electric field in this case. So again, we should think about inside and outside of the shell. So inside of the shell, if you think about symmetry, the electric field should only depend on the s-direction and only point in the s-direction. So we, in order to draw a Gaussian surface, let's think about that symmetry. We're probably going to want cylindrical symmetry, a cylinder with some radius s. So let's draw in our Gaussian surface inside here, the radius s, and give it some length, oh, say l. Okay, so then the flux of the electric field through this surface, well, it's just the flux of the electric field through the side of this surface. The end caps don't give anything. And so that's the electric field times 2 pi times s times the length l. So it's electric field times the outer surface area of the cylinder. So charge enclosed, well, the charge enclosed is just zero. There's nothing enclosed by this particular surface. Uh, so you have zero electric field. And if you think about that, the electric field being inside being zero, well, that kind of makes sense by symmetry. Um, the electric field cancels out inside from a shell, it's kind of like electric field inside of a spherical shell. You would expect that electric field to be zero as well. Okay, so outside apparently is where all the action is. Um, and outside, the electric field should have the same symmetry properties, namely it only points in the s direction and only depends on the x direction. Again, we draw a Gaussian surface. The Gaussian surface that we're going to want to draw is a cylinder, but this time with the radius s greater than r. So let's draw in a Gaussian surface outside of our cylindrical shell. There we are. And give it some length l. And again, it has some radius s greater than r. OK, so we can evaluate the flux of the electric field through this surface. And it's the same as before. It's the same as in, essentially in all cases, this ends up being the same. Um, so the electric field is just the electric, or sorry, the electric flux is the electric field times the surface area. The charge enclosed, well, naively we just write that integral over dq, or I could write that then as integral of rho d tau prime, since we have a, a volume charge. And if you think about that, that is whatever the charge is on this cylindrical shell surface here. Well, we could try and figure out what that is, guess what that is. But really what we mean here is we want to do an integral over the volume enclosed by the cylinder. So it's a triple integral. Rho is sigma, it's a delta function. And then we have our volume form, our volume element, s prime, ds prime, d5 prime, dz prime. If you think about the limits on the integral, the s prime integral should go from 0 to s, where s is greater than r. It's the radius of the cylinder. Uh, phi and z should go 0 to 2 pi. And I just want to point out that we're using the primed variables here. And these primed variables mean these are the integration variables. s is the actual radius of our Gaussian surface here that we're interested in. This now becomes three separate integrals that you can set up and do. So notice that the s integral is an integral over a delta function. And so this is going to pick out a value s equal to r. So then each of these is straightforward to do. And we ultimately get for q enclosed 2 pi l sigma r. So now we're pretty much there. We have the two halves of Gauss's law. So let's put those two halves together. The flux of the electric field must be equal to the charge enclosed over epsilon naught. So putting in for flux and charge enclosed, we can solve for the electric field, canceling some factors. And the electric field should be sigma r over epsilon naught, 1 over s. And I want to point out that this 1 over s, again, this looks like a line charge, as, we, as we've seen before. And so it's kind of a generic feature that we expect in this case.